which will be held by Dr. Razmik Panosyan, who is currently the director of the Armenian Communities Department of the Kalus Gulbenkian Foundation. Uh, he has a book in his account, The Armenians from Kings to Priests to Merchants and Commissars, and he has obtained his PhD from the London School of Economics, uh, his MA from York University, his BA in McGill. You see the regions in which he is formed. So his job is in connection with this uh, uh, geography. And we'll be glad to hear him and then ask our questions. Thank you very much uh, for this kind invitation. Uh, I should say that uh, I'm here because I have written a thing or two about Armenian identity and uh, not representing formally at least the Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation. Um, so Armenian identity, and here we're talking about national identity, has always been fragmented. So that's a blanket statement to start with. It's always been fragmented. Khachik already, Khachik Professor Khachik Tologian already mentioned, uh, you know, multi-local, the word that I used. Uh, Sebu Aslanian uses polycentric, and of course, Professor Tololian uses transnation to more or less refer to the same thing. Furthermore, what I say that this fragmentation is a good thing. It's not a problem. It has actually meant the survival of the people as we know as Armenians. And yet, despite this fragmentation, Armenian identity has somehow been bounded together, which enables us to speak of one people, one nation, despite some profound differences. And this notion of somehow being together, uh, this subjective notion, has come up with the previous presentations as well. Now, always is a long time. So I'm actually going to focus on 200 years of history, not very long. So 200 years in about 15 minutes. And in these 15 minutes, I'm going to divide it up into three sections. In the first part, and the second part mostly relying on the work in my book, in the first part, it's going to be on the 19th century, where I'm in about five minutes, where I'm going to trace how modern national identity was constructed in a multi-local manner. In other words, how the Renaissance, the Zartung, as we call it, itself was quite decentralized. And again, Professor Tololian mentioned some of these things already. In the second part, I'm going to talk about Soviet rule in another five minutes, and how Soviet Armenia was consciously made the homeland through Soviet policy, policies vis-a-vis -vis the nation, and how this, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the diaspora, sorry, and how this was, this resonated in the diaspora. And the third part, a bit more polemical, I suppose, is going to be about the post-Soviet period, how Armenians, drunk with statehood, are neglecting the diaspora. And this is a dangerous thing. And the image of uh, the drunkenness with statehood is something that I have borrowed or stolen from Father Zekian with his permission. It's something that he, he mentioned in a private conversation. Now, let me start with the first, with the first part, the multi-local Armenian Renaissance. Uh, Armenians have existed for a long, long time, but modern identity, as we know it, was created during the 19th century, and it gelled during the second half of the 19th century. My point is that the dynamics, uh, under which we put under the rubric of the awakening of the Renaissance, in fact, entail three sources of imagining the same nation. That three general sets of p parallel awakenings, parallel in general, but sometimes also uh, interacting, three parallel awakenings took place, the western point, the eastern point, and the central point, which I'll explain in a second. The objective of all was the same, the liberation or the reform uh, of the Armenian nation. Now, the Western point, based in Istanbul, Constantinople, as well as some other West European cities, Venice, Vienna, 
thanks to the Mikhitaris, Paris to some degree. The Western point evolved around the liberal reform project influenced by French and Itali Italian thought, constitutionalism, and what generally was known or is known as Western nationalism. The Eastern point, based in Tbilisi, in Tiflis, and in other cities of the Russian Empire, Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Dorpat, which is now in uh, Estonia, was influenced by Russian and German thought, radicalism, and more the, rom the more romantic Eastern nationalism. The central point itself was the homeland, the indigenous conditions in Ottoman Armenian provinces, the, the six vilayets. Now, it is important to note that that was also mentioned before that none of these points was affiliated with an Armenian state or if anything even resembling a state structure. The church came the closest, I suppose, but the church was not necessarily the driving force uh, of the, of the Zartung. What emerges then is a trialing, trialing, triangular relationship with two of the three ideological sources of imagining the nation based in diaspora and communities. And by the end of the 19th century, these trends coexisted in Armenian national identity and in the nationalist and revolutionary programs of the Armenian intelligentsia. There was tension and borrowing, of course, between the three approaches, both in, both in identity and politics, as you know, part of the, the Armenian national movement, as I said, and this, these tensions still exist to this day. Now, I don't have time uh, to trace the different ways uh, that uh, I demonstrate this. It's, the most obvious is two vernacular languages emerge in the, in the Armenian context, the Eastern Armenian, Western Armenian. The literary culture that emerged, that was being written, was uh, quite different. It was the realism of the West, uh, focusing on class alienation, um, individual angst, versus the romanticism of the East, uh, national liberation, uh, uh, and, the, and also there was the provincial literature that was also being written. And of course, the political projects as I mentioned, were quite different, constitutional reform versus revolutionary zeal. So five quick, quick points to conclude on part one at the, ex, at the risk of being repetitive. First, modern national identity is being built, the intellectual centers, mostly outside of the homeland in diaspora. Second, it is not being driven by a state, unlike most other European uh, Renaissance movements or nationalist movements at this point. Um, but it is being driven by community structures, groups, po and political parties. Related to this is, very importantly, there is no centralizing or homogenizing force, because there couldn't be. And uh, the fourth point is that it is also important to remember that it's not a new identity that's being created. Ethno-religious Armenian identity existed, but that identity is being reformulated, and it's new in its, so far as it is a modern identity. And the fifth point, something I already mentioned, and I'll come back to it over and over. It's sort of a key point in all of my work, and that is the subjective dimension of people getting up and saying we are Armenian, despite all the quote-unquote objective differences, is crucial in telling the story of Armenian identity. And because of that, not two nations were created, but one, diverse and in multi-local manner. So let me come to the second part, how Soviet Armenia became the homeland. Um, the, the process of nation building continued in the 20th century with, again, two parallel processes, a diaspora-style nation building led by uh, community organizations, mostly in the Middle East, and also Soviet-style nation building uh, in the Armenian SSR. And as we know, the diaspora itself was bitterly divided um, over, how, over its relationship uh, with Soviet Armenia, with the more significant Dashnak-controlled Dashnak diaspora, Soviet Armenia was not considered was not considered the homeland until much, much later in the 1970s. Now, this started to change in the 1960s for several reasons. Part of it is because things started to change in Armenia as it became more national and more nationalizing. And also things started to change uh, in the diaspora as well. The Iron Curtain became a bit uh, more transparent. 
Trans instrumental in this shift was a specific organization created uh, in Armenia, or the Committee for Cultural Ties with Diaspora Armenians, created in 1964, with the explicit intent of projecting soft power, as we would call it now, and eventually turning the diaspora in favor of Armenia as the homeland. And it succeeded with, through its uh, many programs and whatnot. So the success was that what used to mean Tebi Yergir as the historic homelands in eastern Turkey, Tebi Yergir came to be, came, came to be meant towards the Republic of Armenia. And that was very clear in the early period of independence. Now, my point is not that this should not have happened, that, uh, but rather to show how Armenia, the Republic, became a homeland and the center of Armenian identity was a consciously implemented Soviet policy. And it succeeded uh, partly, but not wholly. In my, uh, in my research in the archives when I was working in Armenia uh, in the 1990s, I came across a very interesting document from 1974. It was called the Minister's Report, addressed to the Armenian Communist Party Central Committee and the USSR Foreign Affairs Ministry regarding the implementation of efforts to neutralize the anti-Soviet propaganda of the Dashnaks in Armenian colonies in the diaspora. <laughs> very long title, but very clearly what its intention is. And it lists 28 different points of what each Soviet Armenia should do in order to achieve this goal. And this is all related about identity as well. Um, and some of the points are rather uncannily similar to, uh, to current policies, but let's not go there. Um, and I'll mention some. Soviet successes to be emphasized uh, in the diaspora, uh, Soviet Armenian successes. The school textbooks to be written and sent, and cultural agitators, as is put, to be sent abroad. To allow Armenian teachers from the Republic to teach in, Arme in diaspora schools, to bring diaspora teachers to Armenia, to be trained, have student exchanges, invite diaspora children to summer camp in Armenia, and bring youth groups, et cetera, et cetera. As I said, it's a long, it's a long list. Now, this, this was the part of the state doing it. And again, as Professor Tololian mentioned, the state policies do matter in, uh, in, in uh, strengthening or creating uh, specific identities. The other side was the intellectual work that was being done through prominent writers like Silva Gabudigian. And again, I'm, I think I'm uh, in my last five, six minutes, so I'll try to wrap things up. Um, so. People like Silva Gabudigian, I shouldn't have reminded you of it here. Yeah? Uh, people like Silva Gabudigian and, uh, and others were very clearly writing about the diaspora with an agenda. She took three long trips to the diaspora and after each she wrote a book. And the point that was being made is that first comes the Republic, second comes the diaspora. The Republic is the, ce is the center of Armenian identity in Armenian culture. Her message and the message of her generation of intellectuals actually resonated quite a bit in the Armenian diaspora. And her equivalent, her sort of counterpart, I would say, in the Armenian diaspora was um, Antranik Zarugian. Zarugian, a former uh, ARF uh, member, was one of the first diasporans who actually went to Soviet Armenia in the late 50s, I think, or early 60s, and came back and wrote a very significant book called Old Dreams, New Ways. And from the title, you can actually see what the thesis is. Soviet Armenia is the new road in the realization of the Armenian dream of national survival. So to quote him, this fatherland, Soviet Armenia, no longer needs us, the diaspora, all that much. But we need the fatherland more to see the new, road, the new roads taking us to our old dreams. Again, I'm just citing two very specific individuals, but there is a long genre of literature and uh, a lot of writing about this. So where are we in terms of our overall story? So multi a multi-local national identity construction in the 19th century, which continues into the 20th century, parallel processes of diaspora uh, nation building and uh, Soviet Armenian, 
and then a very clear policy in Soviet Armenia to turn it into the homeland and the sources of legitimate identity. Onto this comes the independence of 1991, the Rabakh movement and the independence of 1991. So a few minutes, a few uh, uh, minutes on the post-independence period. Of course, after 600 years, Armenia becomes independent and a lot of celebration was expected. Um, it was, the Republic was to be cherished, supported, especially given that its birth was a very difficult one with the earthquake uh, and the war with Azerbaijan. So in the 1990s, it made complete sense for diasporans to focus their attention on a fledging newly independent state. So my question is, does this make sense 25 years later? And this is the more editorializing part of, of my presentation. I think after 25 years, the pendulum needs to swing back a little to encourage development of both a strong diaspora and a strong homeland. I think there is enough money in Armenia, or rather in the hands of the oligarchs, to transform it into a model country, and yet diasporans still feel compelled to support Armenia, uh, Armenia as a needy homeland. So my argument is twofold. First, we need to strike the right balance. And second, we must be very wary, very careful of one center trying to control the entire nation. So let me start with the second. Controlling the Armenian diaspora from one center, be it Yerevan or anywhere else, is impossible. The diaspora is too diverse, too decentralized, too independent to be controlled, at least successfully. It can certainly be weakened but it cannot be effectively controlled. And it should not be controlled or attempted to be controlled or homogenized. I see control, homogenization, centralization as different elements of the same concept. It's very strength, the diaspora is very strength, and the strength of the Armenian people lies in the fact that the nation has always been decentralized. The, we survived the Armenian culture and we survived the genocide because of its dis decentralization. We survived the Stalinist uh, dark days because of this de de uh, decentralization. And I think we will survive the, the crisis in the Middle East because of this decentralization. Moreover, it is, if we look at Armenian history, even during the period of the kingdoms, we will see that Centralization is a very foreign concept to Armenian um, political culture and generally to Armenian, uh, Armenian culture, with the exception of uh, you know, specific things like religion, for example, which, was, uh, which united Armenians until, until the 19th century, the, the apostolic church. Um, and the second point here is that at this juncture, we should honestly ask centralization to where? and controlled by whom. Yes, the Republic is important. Yes, Armenia has, achieved, has obtained a lot of achievements. But nevertheless, it does remain a problematic country with very serious problems. And having a strong and independent diaspora, in my view, is the equivalent of having an insurance policy, not only as a source of uh, resources, but also as a pool of where identity could be kept. 50 years down the road, there will be an Armenian diaspora. We will not recognize its shape. Maybe the language will not be Armenian, or it will be completely different. But I assure you that there will be a group of people in this world calling themselves Armenians that are advocating and mobilizing for Armenian issues. And I certainly hope 50 years down the road, there will be very strong and independent and vibrant Armenia. But also, we have to be very realistic that if we are in a neighborhood and in a neighborhood that is difficult, economic, geopolitical, and demographic and military trends are not in the favor of maintaining a strong independent republic. Um, so to conclude, I think I'm already two, three minutes over, over time. Uh, to conclude, a prosperous and secure Armenian nation is contingent upon both the state and the diaspora with its many diverse communities, independent of one another but reinforcing each other. It depends on the continuation of the multi-local production of identity. Weakening one in favor of another is not only 
that strategy, I think it's downright dangerous. Yes, states are important, but the Armenian case shows that diasporas are just as important, and it is diasporas that have been the sources of Armenian identity maintenance and creation. So let us not sacrifice the diaspora, the, an entity that has sustained Armenian culture in this city and in many other places um, for the sake of a brave 25-year-old uh, uh, independent state. Thank you very much.